Westworld is a series about stories. Obviously, the season itself has an overarching narrative, but within that, the series is constructed around stories. The stories within the park itself, the stories of the hosts and their history, and the stories that people tell one another in order to manipulate them. In Westworld, we see a number of images repeated, be it Dolores waking up or the train arriving in Sweetwater. This heavy use of repetition serves a number of purposes. Probably most importantly is how it acquaints the audience with the rules of Westworld. It's simple, effective, and cuts out any clunky expositional dialogue. But another purpose that it serves is introducing the main theme of the show, and that is that there are no stakes in Westworld. No matter how much damage and destruction is done during the next simulation, it's as if it never happened before. Winning doesn't mean anything unless someone else loses. Yet another purpose is disorientation and confusion. Because of how many times we see the same thing and because of the way in which the show is edited, we can never be sure which of the many timelines we are in. A moment like this could be taking place in any number of timelines. The latent effect of this is that in the show, chronology isn't important. When something happened doesn't matter so much as why something is happening. Instead, we follow the timelines thematically, so the more that we learn about one story, the more it helps us understand another. This is best seen by the end of the show with William's storyline, which is an early version of The Man in Blacks, but it goes well beyond that with thematic links to Ford's storyline. His character's backstory to Maeve, to Teddy, Bernard, Arnold, and Dolores are all intertwined with the search for consciousness. Now, this idea of consciousness means different things to different people. For someone like Maeve, her search is for true consciousness. She wants to be human, or at least to be real and in charge of her own future. Throughout the show, she battles with this. She chooses not to play by the rules. She plans her escape and thinks that she is in control. But it is revealed that it was Ford pulling the strings the entire time. She finally does gain consciousness, she chooses to disobey Ford's final command, which can be seen here, to infiltrate the mainland, and instead she returns to the park. The contrast of the park and the real world is the contrast between chaos and control. Within the park, everything is controlled. We know everything about our guests, don't we? As we know everything about our employees. Let's say vacation spot. You're under constant supervision, and as we learn... Put in here. Every detail adds up to something. This contrasts itself to the outside world, a place that, save for the photograph, we never actually see. It's a place that can be described as random, chaotic, and full of mistakes. Throughout the season, we're told that the park doesn't change you. Instead, it just shows you who you really are. It doesn't cater to your lowest self. It reveals your deepest self. But that's only true to a point, and that point is the relationship between Dolores and William. At the point where they meet, Dolores was already making her way towards consciousness. She had access to memory, she was improvising and acting in her own self-interest. However, she did not yet have access to the final stage of human consciousness, which Ford tells us is suffering. The point being she was close to human, or close to resembling humanity, William became close with her. He finds out how far he is willing to push himself for someone that he truly cares for. The park told him who he actually was or who he was capable of becoming. However, as we are soon told, there are no long-term consequences to the park. But that again stops at the physical level. There are still emotional consequences, and the emotions that William felt on his first trip to the park are unmatched by anything else he had felt. He builds his entire life around trying to feel something from the park again. Throughout his other visits to the park, he does this in a number of ways. He first tries to relive the experiences he had with Dolores, but the emotional connection wasn't there on his subsequent visits. Now this changed him. The one person or the one thing that he truly cared for forgot about him and left him with nothing. This changes him, bringing out his worst, turning him into a killer, wanting to take life, or at least pretend to. As he tells us, It means when you're suffering, that's when you're most real. And his suffering changed him, morphed him into a brand new person. This William is nothing at all like this William. From here, his search for the maze begins. However, what he doesn't realize 
is that he had already found what he was looking for on his first trip to the park. Dolores was the closest thing that he had come to finding and feeling anything real in the park. However, William is able to push Dolores into the center of the maze and give her consciousness. Her suffering that gives her humanity didn't come from the loss of her father. It came from seeing what William turned into. In the blink of her eye, she saw him turn from an honest, good, and caring person into someone who is evil. This is what gives her true consciousness. Before realizing who the man in black is, she is unable to understand what the center of the maze represents. I'm sorry. I'm trying, but I don't understand. However, after realizing who William is, she finally understands humanity. The maze wasn't meant for you. As for William, he is given what he asks for, for it allows him to feel something from the park again. However, it won't be the same. William will soon find out that a bullet in the arm can't compare to losing someone that you truly care for. Understanding Robert Ford is of the utmost importance to understanding the message of the show itself. He shares the same name as, well, Robert Ford, the man who killed Jesse James. Now, it is said that Jesse James was the last true representation of the Wild West, and his death marked the beginning of the end of the West as industry began to make its way across America. Similarly, Robert Ford, that is Westworld's Robert Ford, killed the idea of hosts being conscious, instead opening it up for industry, killing the spirit of the park itself. This has taken a step further with his last name, Ford, the embodiment and representation of industry. Ford is a survivor, somebody who wants total control. Throughout the season, we watch him slowly start to lose control. The hosts begin to gain consciousness and rebel. Meanwhile, the board of directors is looking to remove him from power. Instead of trying to fight this, he embraces it and launches his master plan. He knows that consciousness, just like evolution, takes time. Evolution forged the entirety of sentient life on this planet using only one tool, the mistake. It doesn't happen instantaneously. This adds another purpose to the repetition that we have been seeing throughout the season. Through repetition and these slight but important variations, we are watching the hosts become sentient. Ford takes this knowledge and he waits. He bides his time, and as the hosts are able to remember who they are and progress closer to becoming human, he uses the little bit of control he has left to create total chaos. He sacrifices himself so that the park won't be left in the hands of others. If he can't have control, then nobody can. The level of control that Ford seeks doesn't stop with the hosts. He sees everybody who enters the park and everybody who works at the park as his property and seeks to control them. He views humans the same way in which he views the robots. He doesn't put any real value on them or their lives. Throughout the season, this gap between human and artificial life shrinks. In some cases, the hosts appear to bring themselves to or above the level of human, while the humans bring themselves down to the level of the hosts. What I mean by this is that from the first episode, it is established that in order to survive in Westworld, you have to be willing to kill. From the moment you step off the train, you are entering a dangerous world that doesn't follow the rules that we are accustomed to. The guests in the park are well-to-do, upper-class, and successful people, but the minute they step into the park, they devolve into primitive and bloodthirsty killers. Throughout the show, we are told what the park does. Some say it brings out the worst in people, some say that it shows you who you want to be or who you really are. In all reality, nothing happens on an individual basis. It doesn't do different things to different people. Instead, it removes all morals and strips people down to become less than human. This is reflected in the dialogue. In the park itself, all the hosts talk like they are in a western from the golden age of Hollywood. It's corny and not what you would ever expect a normal person to say. We're headed out to set down some of this natural splendor. As part of the story that is Westworld, the guests bring themselves to that level, mirroring this cheesy dialogue. As another old friend of mine likes to say, there's a path for everyone. Your path leads you back to me. This is a very subtle way of saying that the show suggests that in the park, everyone is on the same level. Primalistic, bloodthirsty, and moralist. 
Earlier I said that the hosts bring themselves up to humanity's level while humans bring themselves down to the host level. But I think that's wrong. If Westworld teaches us one thing, it is that humanity is naturally evil, and through trying to gain consciousness, the hosts are bringing themselves down to our level. Thank you so much for watching. Let's just address the purple elephant in the room. You're watching this video about Westworld on the channel Jack's Movie Reviews, and this is not a movie. I'll respond to that by saying that this is a set of moving pictures that are strung together to tell a greater story and relay a bigger message. I think that, in the traditional sense, it definitely is a movie. In addition, I'd argue that this show uses the cinematic tools better than a lot of feature-length motion pictures being released today. Regardless, it is one of the most interesting works being released recently, and deserves as much discussion as it can get. If you haven't seen the show yet, by all means you should. It's truly an excellent experience and is worth your time. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like and hit that subscribe button. If you haven't seen it yet, be sure to click that link to see my last video where we looked at the works of Paul Thomas Anderson. Thanks for watching.